Welcome to the 2020 Aspen Center for Physics, Heinz R. Pagel's Physics Talks, an online version of the series usually offered at the center. My name is Peter Maxim, and I'm an astrophysicist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. If you did not receive the email of the lecture schedule or the description of tonight's lecture, you could be added to our mailing list by contacting the center. This series of talks will be live online every Thursday evening at 5.30 Aspen time or 11.30 p.m. UTC through August and posted on YouTube the following day. All right, so there's a real danger in astrophysics of becoming so buried in the specialized knowledge of your subfield so that you can't see the forest for the trees. If you focus too narrowly on the details of a particular complex corner of an ecosystem, like a tree in a forest, then you may miss the things that glue the ecosystem together. To really understand a forest, you have to understand bees and ants and fungus and other things that aren't trees but affect each and every tree. Black holes are like those things. They have their own properties, but they don't just sit there passively eating. They're a critical, active, connected part of the cosmic ecosystem. The Aspen Center for Physics is the perfect place to dig deep into this cosmic ecosystem because new connections bring new insights. You can make new connections at any big conference, but here in Aspen, you have the time and freedom and familiarity and focus to dig deep and come out with new insights, new goals, and new collaborations that become the seeds of real understanding. Because of COVID-19, we're going to have to try this one again next year, but tonight we still hope to share some of the puzzles and wonders that drew us to Aspen. Tonight's speaker is Professor Jane Dai of the University of Hong Kong. She earned her PhD in physics at Stanford and has since then also worked at Yale, the University of Chile, the University of Maryland, and the Niels Bohr Institute in Denmark. But for all of her impressive credentials, the one that you should care about the most is this. When we had to pick a top-notch expert to attend our workshop who could connect her expertise on how massive black holes rip stars apart to deeper and broader physics that the entire astrophysical community wants to understand, she was the obvious choice. Her work uses sophisticated computer models to investigate how matter behaves near a black hole just before it falls in and answers questions that have been bothering me ever since my own thesis. Jane is no stranger to Aspen. She won a much deserved block award for her presentation at the 2018 Aspen Winter Conference on this topic, which I count myself fortunate to have attended. We will not interrupt Jane during her talk, so you will be muted, but raise your hand by clicking the hand at the bottom of your screen if you have a question, and I will call on you during the Q&A, and we'll wrap up by 6.30. We'd also like you to know that your video image may be included in the YouTube posting. If you don't wish to be seen, please turn your video off. Finally, we're pleased that many physicists are attending tonight, but since this is a public talk, please save your technical questions for another occasion. Now, without further ado, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Peter, for this very nice introduction. Uh, it's very nice meeting you today. Uh, thank you for joining me during this very special time. I was really hoping to be able to visit Aspen again and talk to other people about black holes and enjoy some hiking this summer, which unfortunately cannot happen this year. Uh, but hopefully everything will get better and I can visit lovely Aspen and maybe see you in person again next year. And at the meantime, uh, let's, I'm happy to share uh, about what I work on for about black holes and let's have this little exploration into the celestial space together today. So in today's talk, uh, I'm gonna talk about two things. First, I will give a brief introduction about how general relativity predicts that black holes exist and talk about the biggest black holes that exist in our universe. And then we will jump into the topic of tonight, which is uh, how black holes tear past stars and becomes bright. And in this part, I will follow a bit of a historical approach. I will first talk about some theoretical predictions people made like 50 years ago before we have telescopes to see this type of events. And then I will uh, talk about what kind of light uh, these things produce and what do we see these days. 
and especially I will mention some of the developments on the challenges that have been posed by the observations and our new understanding um, of the physics here um, after uh, we dig more into the details of the physics. Okay, so let's begin the talk today. So first, let's talk about general relativity. As you know, general relativity was developed by uh, people like Albert Einstein. And they were saying matter is energy. And more than that, when we have a heavy object in space, it is like putting a very heavy ball on a flat uh, mattress, spring mattress, and uh, the, the ball will make a dent on the mattress. And similarly, when we have a heavy celestial object, like a star, uh, it will make the gravity of this object will make the space time around it no longer flat, but curved, shown here. And when we have a very massive and very dense object like a black hole, what happens is that the space time becomes so curved that it actually creates a singularity in space time. And the meaning of this is if another object is approaching the black hole and gets too close, then it has no other route but to fall into this gravitational potential well. It cannot escape from it. So this region of no return is called a black hole. This sounds like a very abstract concept, but actually physicists love black holes very much. And the reason is because they are very simple to be studied. Any black hole can be described using only two quantities, its mass, meaning how heavy it is, and its angular momentum, meaning how fast it's rotating around itself. So in principle, a black hole can also have a third parameter, which is the electric charge it carries, but actually in nature, the charge will become neutral very soon. So it's sufficient to use the previous two parameters to describe any black hole. And the marriage of this is a black hole can have a complicated history uh, to grow to be the current size and mass, but we don't need to care much about that because no matter what you fit, to this black hole, whether you give it your favorite Western food or favorite Eastern food, or uh, you give, feed it with stars, as we, we are going to talk about tonight. The black holes, what comes out of this is still this spherical-ish void in space-time that can be described by only two parameters. And you might wonder whether black holes do really exist in nature or not. And nowadays we know black holes do exist, but if actually, if you asked the top physicist or astronomer 50 years ago, they were actually not so sure. And actually people back then were studying how black holes rip stars as a theoretical concept, hoping that we can observe this one day to prove that black holes do exist. But these days we know they exist, and the, the biggest black holes actually reside in the center of galaxies. For example, this is a artist's illustration of our Milky Way galaxy, if we can see it from top down. And our sun, our solar system is here. It is in the outer skirt of this disc-shaped um, galaxy. And in the very center of it, there is actually an enormous black hole, which is as heavy as 4 million suns. And this black hole is not very bright. It's actually quite dim. And you might wonder uh, then if you say that this black hole is really black, then how do we know it exists? And furthermore, how do we even know the weight of it? So a very famous uh, physicist, Stephen Hawking, once made an analogy to explain this. And he said, imagine we are sitting in a very dark ballroom and there is a couple dancing together. And we cannot see the gentleman because the room is very dark and he is wearing a black suit. So it's not very easy to see him clearly. However, we can see the lady who is in white dress and she is uh, moving and spinning and rotating very fast. And we, we know there must be a gentleman who is holding her. And the same applies to the black hole in the center of our galaxy. 
Although we cannot see the black hole itself, we can see the stars that are orbiting around it close by. And here I'm going to show you a movie which was taken uh, using the CAC telescope at the UCLA Galactic Center Group. And today this still remains as one of the best evidences uh, of showing that black holes do exist. So here, this group have taken an image of this part of the sky over more than 10 years. And you can see how the star move uh, over this period of time. Let's see this again. You can see that some of the closed stars have already made a full elliptical orbit around some central point in our galaxy. So the point indicated by this star is the location of the black hole. And from the orbits of the stars, and by applying Kuiper's law, we can calculate the mass of this black hole to be as heavy as 4 million suns. And over uh, the last few years, you must have heard of the Event Horizon Telescope and the image it has taken over uh, the shadow of a black hole. So the Event Horizon Telescope is actually not a telescope. It's not just one single telescope. It is actually a program putting all the most powerful radio telescopes all over the world together and use the size of the Earth as a baseline to enhance the power of these telescopes. And the image, the famous image it has released, is not our um, galactic center supermassive black hole, it's actually the next closest black hole in the center of a galaxy called Messier 87 in the Virgo cluster, as shown here. So this is the shadow of the black hole sitting um, in some very hot, bright gaseous structure. So you might wonder what is making um, the gas so bright around the black hole. So actually, a black hole is not always black. It sometimes can become bright, and the light we are seeing is the last light emitted by the gas before it is being consumed um, by a black hole. And these guys would spiral to approach the black hole, and they will form a structure which looks like a disk or towers, and we usually call this a accretion disk. And the gas rub against each other. There are lots of friction. There are lots of other high energy processes happening in this disk, which is why it becomes very hot. And what happens when the object becomes very hot? Like the fire, like our sun and other stars, you know, a hot object would emit light. And the same happens for this gas disk structure around the black hole. Uh, the only difference is that it is really, really bright. It's much brighter than a star. The, if a black hole can be consuming a lot of interstellar gas, then the brightness of this structure around the black hole itself can sometimes even outshine all the stars in one galaxy. And actually, the black hole is very efficient in converting the matter into energy. And compared with nuclear fusion, it is like a modern car compared with a old time carriage. And nowadays, uh, astronomers know that there is a black hole actually in the center of every big galaxy in the sky. And this is a deep field image taken by the Hubble telescope. And every cloud structure you see here is actually, or dot here is actually a galaxy you see nearby and far away. And we know all of them harbor a very massive black hole in the center of it. So how, did, how do we have this uh, galaxy structure as we see these days in the universe? Astrophysicists are also starting to understand how the universe is assembled since the Big Bang. And people do simulations like this um, from the beginning of the universe until now. So we can see that um, the black holes have actually been formed together with the galaxy millions of years, very shortly after the Big Bang. And they have been evolved 
for billions of years and even over 10 billion years since then. And you can see sometimes these galaxies attract each other. The small galaxies can be eaten by the big galaxies. They can join together. And at the same time, the, the big black hole in the center of the galaxies are not just sitting there. They are also growing by eating the gas in the galaxy or by joining together with another black hole to become a bigger one. So it is actually a very hot topic. Um, in astronomy, they say to study how the black holes and galaxies grow together since early universe until the way they seem these days. And in order to study this, um, we need to know, we need to be able to probe this black holes far away to know their properties. And how can we do that? I like our Milky Way galaxy and Messier 87, most of these galaxies and black holes are very far away, so we cannot see the stars orbiting, individual stars orbiting in these galaxies. And also, actually, most of these black holes, more than 90% of them, are actually not actively consuming gas uh, as we see them. They're actually just sitting there quite dark and invisible. So what can we do to see these black holes? And that leads us to the topic of tonight, which is black hole tears apart stars. Um, lucky for us, the, these black holes, these giants are not sleeping in the center of galaxies all the time. Occasionally, there is a way to wake them up and they eat some snacks and become visible. So if we zoom into the center of a galaxy, there are lots of stars there. The, the environment is very dense and we know the stars are orbiting around the center at very high speed. So this is like creating a large hydron collider in the center of a galaxy where you put, inject lots of energetic particles. Uh, what happens then? These stars can scatter around each other and change the orbits. And sometimes a star can become very unfortunate to approach the black hole too closely and you will be shredded by the black hole and the black hole can shine temporarily for a few years because of this. And in every galaxy, on average, this happens once in about uh, 10,000 years. So let's see this beautiful movie made by NASA showing what is happening in the process. We see the black hole sitting here and the unfortunate star is approaching. It gets elongated and shredded, and part of the shredded material can form this, this structure around the black hole and becomes very bright so we can see the light emitted by this event. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to explain some basic hap physics happening in the process so you know why exactly do we see an event like this. So what is disrupting or destroying the star? This is the same type of force that is creating ocean tides on the Earth. It is because of gravity. The side of the Earth that is closest to the moon or the sun experiences a slightly larger gravitational force compared to the opposite side, which is why we see the ocean um, on the surface of Earth to have a non-spherical shape. And if you have watched movie Interstellar, you might remember uh, the, 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 the characters in the movie went to this planet near a black hole called Gagwanta. And there they experienced some very huge tides. The tides are much more fierce than those on Earth. It is as high as a tall building. And this is because that planet is pretty close to a black hole in that movie. And the gravity, the gravitational pull is much, much bigger uh, compared to that from our moon or the sun. And a star tearing being torn apart by a black hole, or this is called a tidal disruption event, is a more severe phenomenon happening, but because of the same reason. As a star is approaching the black hole, 
is becomes elongated, its whole surface becomes distorted because of this tidal force of gravity from the black hole. And eventually, it's, the star can no longer hold itself together. It becomes shredded, and about half of the stellar material will then orbit around the black hole and eventually be eaten by the black hole. And the other half of the stellar material will escape from the black hole. And perhaps we can understand this a bit better um, by looking at something familiar to you. So we can imagine the star is, uh, we can separate the star into two parts. There is the red half of the star is a bit closer to the black hole. So it is feeling a stronger gravitational pull. And therefore this is like a skier who is skiing down a very steep slope. And the other half of the star is experiencing a slightly lower uh, gravitational pull and he or she is going down a flat slope. Initially, they were together and they could hold a rope together. But as they keep sliding down and they were trying to hold the same, the hold, hold the same rope together, but however, this skier is experiencing a much stronger force and wants to go down the slope much faster than the other one. And eventually when they get close to the black hole, the difference in their slope will become very severe. So eventually the rope will be broken and this skier would be going in the orbit, which is a bit closer to the black hole and the other skier will be on another orbit, which is a bit farther um, away from the black hole. And then for the first skier who is sliding down the slope very quickly to approach the black hole, um, this represents the, the, the half of the star that will be eventually consumed up by the black hole. But how does it happen exactly? Because this material is swirling and rushing towards the black hole. And in order to find its way into the black hole, it actually needs to slow down and form a small accretion disk. And what helps here for the, for the uh, material to break hard is again, always the help of general relativity. So you might have heard of that the Mercury's orbit around the sun is not a, uh, a full ellipse, but it actually is an ellipse that is orbiting around the sun because of general relativistic precession and it forms this uh, rose petal pattern around the sun. And the same is happening for this stream. Um, and let's see this beautiful movie made by Clement uh, showing what happens to the stream. So after it flies by the black hole at a speed which is close to the speed of light, it has a very sharp turn around the black hole. Let's see this again. It flies towards it and it, um, the orbit turns around. So the stream collides into itself to break and stop and form this small disk structure around the black hole to be consumed by the black hole. And um, historically, we call this process circularization. It's because the stream goes from a, a very elliptical orbit to become a almost circular orbit. So 50 years ago, the um, astrophysicist made calculations on using pen and paper to calculate the structure and the temperature of this small disk structure around the black hole. And um, they, they get the result to be um, the disk is pretty hot. It is about 10 to the 5 Kelvin. And we know the hotter a material is, the, um, the light it creates has shorter wavelengths. So that means if the object is as hot as this, then it should emit very strongly in X-rays and ultraviolet light. And let's see if that is really what is happening. So based on this prediction, scientists like our host Peter here today use space X-ray telescopes to look for this 
tidal destruction events from faraway galaxies. And for example, this is the SWIFT telescope from NASA, and this is the XM Newton telescope from uh, the European Space Agency. And using this uh, powerful X-ray telescopes, we did find um, we did find a lot of tidal destruction events, including the most famous one, which is called Swift J1644. And here in this figure, we show um, the bright flare that is produced when this black hole is disrupting and eating the star. You can see the black hole was originally very, very uh, black, and it quickly becomes very bright. And over about a year's time, the brightness of the X-ray gradually decays. And after a year, basically, we, cannot, we can no longer see the light emitted by this black hole. It goes back to sleep again. So we have learned a lot of things from these X-ray events. And over the years, uh, we have been observing more and more of these events. And as you can see, the number of events that we are observing since 1997. Originally, we are observing about two events per year, and these days we are observing, we are seeing more than 10 of these events per year using um, these different telescopes. And these days, most of these events that we are seeing are possible uh, made by the large optical telescopes like CDF and the SASIN and the PANSTAR telescopes in Hawaii as shown here. But this more than um, this new observations of tidal destruction events are posing a great challenge to the physicists these days. And let me show you why. So here, again, I show the brightness of the flare in optical and UV bands for an event called PANSTAR 10JH. And as you can see, the black hole starts from very very dark and it turns to be very bright and it gradually decays following some theoretically predicted way and everything is good. But what's the problem? The light we are seeing from this event is in visible light and UV, but we do not see any strong X-rays as predicted by the physicist 50 years ago. So what is happening? These new observations um, is creating a great debate in our research field these days. One group of people think actually not all of these tidal disruption events are the same. Some of them are more energetic than others, and therefore we are like seeing a zoo of different animals. And there is another group of people like me who think we are still seeing the same type of event, but we are like black people touching different parts of elephants and we perceive different things just because our angles is different. So how do we um, tackle this problem to see uh, what is really happening? So people like, for people like me, I want to take a closer look at what happens exactly around the black hole more than what people have done calculated on pen and paper 50 years ago. So actually, the physics here is quite complicated. There are many components at play. There is the gas or the stellar material that is trying to get into the black hole. And as they become very hot, they produce light or radiation. We also know that there are lots of magnetic fields in the environment of a black hole. So all these three components, they um, dance intertwine together and dance around the black hole crazily. And to make the calculations even more complicated, we have to use all the generativistic equations to do the calculations because the space time here is very curved because of the gravity of the black hole. So indeed, this is a problem that is very hard to do on pen and paper. But luckily these days, we have the modern technology to help us and we can write computer codes to run on super clusters. So for example, these are the two clusters that I've used before. Uh, one is the NSF Texas Advanced Computing Center, and the other one is uh, a Tianhe translated into Sky River Supercomputer Center in China. 
And these are actually some of the largest and fastest supercluster centers in the world. And, and these clusters, they can run thousands of parallel jobs and even millions of parallel jobs at the same time. So in um, a few days, they can give us some calculation that a uh, theorist in the old time cannot even finish over his or her lifetime on pen and paper. And I'm also very gladly sharing with you some simulation that I produced after running the um, programs on the superclusters. So here, what I'm showing you is the inner part of this equation disk around the black hole being formed by the stellar material. And in the left panel here, we are seeing the disk from side, and in the right panel, we are seeing the disk from top. Here, the color indicates how dense the material is. The redder it is, that means it's a denser part of, of the disk, and bluer meaning is less dense or very, it's almost like a vacuum here in the dark blue region. And from here, you can see the black, the disk is not very smooth. There are lots of turbulences, eddies happening when the gas is swirling or spiral, spiraling uh, into the black hole. And from this one, we can actually see that something very interesting, which is some of the gas is actually being ejected by the black hole. And the reason is because now we are feeding a lot of material from the star very quickly to the black hole, and the black hole cannot consume all of this together. Instead, um, as it is eating part of this layer material, it also ejects part of the material out in the form of a wind launched from the equation disk. And you can also see some thin lines with arrows. These represent magnetic field lines around the black hole. So actually there are lots of magnetic field lines and especially in this dark blue region close to the polar region of the black hole. And here actually, um, the energy in this space is dominated not by gas or radiation, but by a magnetic field. And in this region, it is actually called a jet launched by the black hole, as you can see in this um, artist's illustration. And in this region, the black hole is ejecting a, a stream of extre extremely energetic particle and light uh, highly beamed along its rotational axis. And these particles are moving at a speed, almost at the speed of light. And the formation of this jet, again, is a um, golden example of general relativity at work. And this is because if, if we have a fastly rotating black hole, then we have this torch-shaped structure called ergosphere in the space-time around it. And a prediction from general relativity is any object that is in the ergosphere have to rotate together with this black hole. It cannot stand still in the, in the space, even if uh, we try to apply some force to stop it. And then as the magnetic field lines are getting into the ergosphere, they are also, they become, uh, the rotation of the black, they have to rotate with the black hole and this magnetic field line hoops form and they act like a spring to eject materials along the spinning axis of the black hole. And this, is, this mechanism was found by Blanford and Zinaik in 1977 and it's believed to be the mechanism producing these streams of materials that are ejected in black holes when they eat stars. And how does this type of simulations help us understand why, black, why the uh, tidal disruption events that we observe can be different? And um, I'm explaining this using a effect brought by the orientation or the angle that we see these events. Because the galaxies in the universe and the black hole directions are oriented randomly with respect to our line of sight. So if we happen to be seeing a black hole eating star event along the direction of the jet, then we can see some very energetic X-ray particles in the jet. And if you're seeing from a top-down direction, then we can still see a exposed accretion disk, which is 
very hard and as the theorists predicted and they should be meeting x3. However, a lot of time we are also seeing this event from sideways and then we are not seeing the disk itself but we are seeing these materials that are injected by the black hole and they are veiling, they are like a veil surrounding the energetic processes that's happening around the black holes. So we cannot see the very high energy light, but we see some low energy light emitted by the wind, and that is going to be mostly invisible light. And also this, help, this type of study can help us address the question we posed at the beginning of this talk. How do we study the black hole's growth and galaxy growth since the early universe until today? So from this type of studies, we know as the black hole is eating gas and growing, it is not just growing passively. Besides consuming gas, it is also actually rejecting gas back into its environment. It is also producing a lot of light. And um, those kind of uh, energy in forms of light and wind and jet, which we call feedback given back to the galaxy, can affect the structure the formation and the evolution of the galaxy as well. So using these simulations and uh, studies, we can, this can help us understand uh, how we get to um, evolve to be, the universe gets evolved to be uh, the way it looks like today. So um, hopefully you have been, um, you find it interesting to know uh, what has been happening in our field uh, in the past few years and the rapid progress. And luckily for us, the field is still growing at accelerating speed. And this is uh, possible, being made possible with a few um, telescopes that is just launched or going to be launched in the next few years. And this include uh, two very powerful X-ray telescopes. One is called Erosita, and the other one is called Einstein Probe. And more than that, uh, we have astronomers have built the most powerful optical survey telescope. It is called the Vera Rubin Observatory, formerly called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. So this telescope has just been finished construction and put in Chile and there, the scientists are testing the telescope right now and hopefully we can uh, start using it to do science very soon. So with the help of these telescopes, in the next 10 years, we are going to see, be able to probe more than 100 black holes per year um, when they disrupt stars and a lot of new science is going to happen because of that. Okay, in the last slide, let me draw the summary of this lecture. So today I have shown you that in the center of every far away big galaxies, there is an enormous black hole sitting there. Occasionally they can rip apart stars and become awake and bright so we can see the light from it for a few years and using that to understand the properties of these black holes. We can do a lot of physics with this. We can probe general relativity. We can learn about how black holes consume and eject material and shine and uh, give feedback to the galaxies. And all of this can help us understand uh, the evolution of the universe. Last but not least, I would like to mention that the frontier of our field is continuously being pushed forward by the most powerful telescopes and simulations in the world. So please stay tuned and uh, look out for the discoveries happening in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, Jane Dai, Professor Jane Dai of the University of Hong Kong. Um, with that, we have uh, plenty of time for questions. If you uh, have a question, please raise your hand. We all, uh, I believe there's a, an option in the uh, uh, attendee and we're, yes, I see some people who are already doing it and I have a, um, a chat message from someone who, um, from uh, Dee Powell, whose uh, mic is not working, it's a text question. Is it possible the question, what's inside a black hole has no meaning, similar to 
what's inside a fundamental particle. Perhaps no singularity, but all of the attributes and information are on the event horizon, composing the surface area for this curvature of spacetime. Could the event horizon spherical shell surface be the superposition of all states from the accreted mass fully entangled and the entropy be the function of that population? Well, for thanks for the question. So for, for astronomer, um, the most important um, information of the black hole is all that is happening outside the event horizon. So there can be things happening inside a black hole, but unfortunately, because of the information paradox, we're not able to know what is happening inside because the information happening inside there cannot be transported outside the event horizon. And therefore, um, I think there are string theorists and other physicists studying those, but for astronomers, the only thing um, we can observe and see are all happening outside the event horizon. And that is why we, we tend to focus on what is happening there. All right. Uh, we have another question uh, that I saw from Adam Zakhar. So I'm going to unmute. You can ask it verbally. Hello, Professor. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, my question is about how we observe these events. Uh, all the phenomena you described were measured in the electromagnetic spectrum. I guess I have a question around, uh, is it useful to look at gravitational waves to understand these events more? And if so, how? And if not, why not? Thank you very much. Oh, that's an excellent question. So this depends for sure that emit gravitational waves. Uh, but when we talk about the radiation or the energy contained in the gravitational wave, um, it's the, the strength of those waves depend on um, the mass of the objects that are orbiting or spiraling into each other, and it depends on the distance between them. So these events, although they can emit gravitational waves, these events are not as a powerful uh, in emitting those waves compared with the case we have observed so far, like two black holes merging together or like two neutron stars. These are stellar mass black holes and neutron stars merging together. So, um, and also to observe um, objects with the size of super, let's big black holes merging with a star, we cannot use the LIGO interferometry, which you probably have heard of to observe this. So scientists are actually building um, space uh, interferometries called LISA to observe um, supermassive black holes merging together. But again, if we have a supermassive black hole and a star and they are merging together, like in this case, then uh, they need to be very close to be observed uh, by using the technology we can develop these days. And it has to happen, if I remember right, it has to happen in the center of our galaxy or in the closest galaxies like Andromeda. If they happen to be eating a stars as we are um, observing the gravitational wave at the same time, then we can see them. But if it happens in a very far away galaxy, then the wave is going to be too weak to be observed from Earth. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we have two more text questions from Robert Cooper and Ava Stockman, and then we have uh, Noah Bray Ali with a hand up for a, uh, an audio question. The one from Ava Stockman is, if a small black hole orbited a supermassive black hole, would it rip the small one apart? Is that possible? A very good question. So, the whether a star or a smaller black hole can be ripped apart by a big star. Um, when we do this type of calculations to know the possibility, uh, it depends on two things. One thing is how strong is the gravitational force from the big black hole, and the other one is depends on the size of uh, the smaller object that might be destroyed. Um, let me go back to the original slide showing this. So here, instead of a, a star, if we have a stellar mass black hole, and let me remind you that the size of a smaller black hole, uh, which has a mass similar to our sun, is actually very, very small. It has a size of 
similar to, it's much smaller than a star or even a planet. Its size is similar to Los Angeles or Hong Kong. So what happens is that the gravitational force that is experienced by two sides of the star, will, by the uh, stellar mass black hole, will not be that different. And therefore, the smaller black hole, instead of having two spheres going down along very different slopes, then the slope will be very similar. And therefore, the smaller black hole will not actually be destroyed by the big black hole. It can stay intact all the way until it plunges into the bigger black hole. Thank you. Sure. We have another question from Robert Cooper in the text. Please, uh, it's a request to please explain current computer modeling issues. Um, I assume you mean the modeling issues for the accretion disk. So, I, I would say a lot of um, bottlenecks here are still driven by our uh, capability of doing the computation. And this is because um, um, when we have all these components um, interacting with each other under the environment close to a black hole, the calculation becomes linear very quickly. So we need huge computing power to solve um, these equations. And for example, like for the simulation I have just shown you, um, it actually took about 10 million CPU hours to run. And then for me, I use thousands of CPUs from the supercluster and I run thousands of parallel jobs. It still takes a few weeks to finish the job. And um, if we want to do all the calculations very, very carefully, uh, but not taking any approximations, that will take even longer. So I would say if, if we can have even more of the next generation of computers, then they can solve more myths about um, puzzles about black holes and other astrophysical phenomena using those. Okay. Uh, our next question is uh, from Noah Bray Ali, who has a hand up. And then after that, uh, a text question from Dan. Hi, Jane. Hi, Peter. My question has to do with the scale. I, I noticed in the simulation results, the distances were plotted in units of R sub G. And I wonder uh, how, how, you know, how does a stellar mass black hole accretion event, say in our galaxy, how does it compare or differ from the events that you showed us, uh, the sudden brightness and so on? And then I guess what I'm, I'm really interested in is what about quasars? Some, you know, some steady source that's just go blasting on all, on all four cylinders for you know, uh, giga years. How, how do these transient events that you're describing to us, how, do, how does your modeling uh, compare or contrast with uh, the, the results, observations, or the simulations of those uh, steady, the steady, the steady part of um, the emission from supermassive black holes? Okay, thanks for the question. So um, if we, when we talk about stellar mass black holes, sometimes they can also eat materials from another star or, or some other um, and gas and also make this, uh, this structure around it to, to shine. And also quasars are other big black holes. Um, they can also become bright sometimes, and but not by eating a star, but by eating some gas in the, in the space or in, in the inner part of the galaxy. For example, when two galaxies merge, they can bring a lot of gas to the center, so the black holes can be eating gas and become bright. And the biggest difference between the transient scenario that I just described with those scenario is that the accretion or eating uh, black hole eating and growing phenomenon is, is very extreme um, in this uh, tidal disruption events. And here we are feeding the black hole at a rate which is 100 times or even thousands of times faster than normal, than in quasars or in uh, normal cases for stellar mass black holes. And actually, this is something we call a, a super Eddington event, and uh, most of the other events, they are sub Eddington events. And for this, uh, for this transient case, the black hole 
is eating material very fast, and this represents perhaps more closely to the environment that we have in the very early universe, where the galaxies are close to each other and there are lots of gas, the universe hasn't expanded so much. So back then, we believe the black holes were eating gas um, more like in these extreme cases rather than the very quietly, um, slowly dining case as we see in the quasars and stellar mass black holes in nowadays galaxies. And this is why we think studying these special cases are very meaningful for us to um, study the evolution of the universe in the beginning, um, in early times. And, and if you want to, uh, and one more thing about the disk itself. So when we, when this disk exists, this so-called Eddington limit, and the black hole is being consumed very fast, we would see a different structure in the equation disk as well. For example, we see a lot of powerful wind, which are not produced in other cases. And also there are some things special about this light that's emitted from this disk as well. Thank you. All right, our next quest, question is currently a text question. Uh, Dan would like to know more about the ejection of matter. Uh, Dan, do you have um, a more detailed question or would you like um, Jane to speak a little more generally? No, I'm just at one, uh, curious about ejection of matter. I thought about it. I'm not a physicist, <laughs> retired psychologist, but I thought that everything that went in was done for it would never come out. Yeah, great question. So these materials actually they have not plunged into the black hole yet. They get very this black uh, dot in the center of this simulation represents the black hole. So all of this event is happening right outside the black hole. So as the material is getting close, very close to the event horizon, some of them can turn around and become wind and be ejected, and some of them would really get into the black hole. And it is also this material that gets close to the black hole, but not in yet, which become very hot, and that is emitting the light that we can see. Thank you. Sure. Right, I don't see any hands up or any more text questions, so, but we do have some more time for another question or two. So if there's anybody who's got something that they like to know that's bothering them, please do uh, raise your hand or send me a message. Hello, Steve Harris. Uh, go on, Steve. <laughs> what, in your calculations, what, what do you assume about dark matter? Do you make any distinction or just do you, do you use whatever mass uh, you, uh, you obtain kinetically? Okay, great question. So in my simulation, actually, I don't care about dark matter. And although we know like over the whole scale of the galaxy, um, dark matter, the energy and mass contained in the dark matter is much more than that contained in the normal visible matter. But actually, uh, when we zoom into the center of the galaxy, the component or the fraction of the dark matter is very tiny compared with the mass of the black hole there. So when we do the calculations, we do not need to take account of the dark matter there because they are neglectable. Thank you. All right, we have a hand up from Thomas Cleveland. Thomas? Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so my question is, is how about how stable is any orbit around uh, the black hole at approximately its distance? How, how stable is the orbit? Um, uh, yes. So um, can, can you clarify your question a little bit? Do you mean um, whether the the trajectory, the orbit is stable or chaotic, or do you mean whether these are uh, like closed orbits or open orbits? Uh, yeah, so from my understanding is because it's, uh, because of how close it is to uh, the black hole, uh, there's relativistic effects that mm -hmm. eventually weaken the pool of the orbit. 
and so my question was is how 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 unstable does it get as it gets closer to the black hole if that makes sense so i think the orbits is always stable uh, it's so if we if we ignore general relativistic event like effects then the orbits is going to be like a ellipse but if as it gets closer and closer to the black hole the general relativity is getting uh, stronger and stronger and these orbits are no longer falling the same way as Newtonian physics predicts and they can have uh, for example if we have a particle with mass it can form this like rose petal pattern around the central object and if this is a particle without mass like our photon which is the particle of light then you will follow some other trajectories predicted by general relativity but I think the orbits always uh, stable in the sense that it is predictable and not chaotic. So if we if give an initial position and velocity of the particles, then if we know the information of the black hole, then it is always a predictable orbit around the black hole. All right, I think we might have time for one more question. And I see Noah Bray Ali has a hand up once more. Um, um, about 40 years ago, so that's less than 50, right? So about 40 years ago, Kip Thorne, you know, is very famous from the Interstellar movie and also from doing physics. Kip Thorne uh, wrote an um, interesting book called The Membrane Paradigm, where he suggested that uh, pen and paper physics um, using the Swartz, using the, the solution for a Kerr black hole, you know, rotating black hole, spinning black hole, could help astrophysicists uh, make better simulations and connect their observations with general relativity. I wonder um, what influenced that 40-year-old pen and paper stuff with the membrane paradigm. Uh, I could maybe say more about it, but uh, what, what influence that has had on your work, if any, your simulations? So all, all the modern, like I have to say, all the modern work we are doing these days, they are still based on the old work, um, the basic predictions that you can make on pen and paper since 40 or 50 years ago. Um, the, the, some of the first outer stuff, like the basic features of them, of these objects can still be well described by using uh, pen and paper analytical calculations. But for some of the, more detailed stuff and um, for example if we want to know exactly how gas and light are at play around the black hole and then we have to uh, go into more details and do these simulations using uh, modern clusters modern computers so i would so say me, like you, people, yeah go ahead so we, we want to put on the cluster the effect of the black hole right so the the, the black hole um it's, it's basically some boundary condition, right? At R equals uh, RG, you know, maybe 1.1 RG or something, right? So what kind of boundary conditions do you use and how do they compare to this membrane paradigm boundary conditions? I don't remember exactly uh, how they would phrase it, but something like, uh, think about the black hole event horizon as a conducting disk with a certain conductivity, uh, the magnetic, uh, there's some current flowing on it and you kind of have a kind of a Maxwell's equations, but with um, um, a gravitational, with a frame drag field and a gravitoelectric field that kind of have the, the flavor of uh, uh, ordinary Maxwell equations, but pulling in the fact that you have this uh, spinning black hole underneath that membrane. So the, the equations and the boundary conditions that we put into the simulations, they are still yeah. as predicted by this theory, classical theory or first order calculations, but, um, the, how this gas evolve or how the radiation is exactly produced, that is something that the old series couldn't give details at the time. But these days, like, when, we, when we make these um, detailed studies using computer simulations, we still go back from time to time to compare with the calculations people have done using pen and paper. And if we see a different result between the simulation and the analytical calculation, then we need to understand what is the region causing that? What is exactly the difference? Like we need to think about the physics responsible for that. So 
in the end, we are physicists, we are not uh, computer scientists. So the, the part we care the most is still the physics and astronomy happening in these events, in these simulations. Okay. Um, we did get one more question uh, privately, a text question, and this will be the last question. Does the energy emitted at the horizon depend upon the mass of both entities? So this depends on um, how the light is emitted. So when we talk about, and, and the quick answer is yes, it does depend on the parameters, the mass and the, the angular momentum of the black hole very sensitively. So to the first order, we know that if a black hole is bigger then this whole disk structure around it is also sized up proportionally. And if we have a bigger object, then it produces more light just because it has more surface area. So for sure, it depends on the size of the black hole and that depends uh, on the mass of the black hole. That linearly depends on the mass of the black hole. And then if we are talking about the light that is produced by this particle stream called jet, and then this depends very sensitively on how fast the black hole is rotating. As we mentioned in the then this Blanford Zianek mechanism, if we have a black hole that is rotating very fast, it creates this ergosphere, and that has made it possible for this stream, this jet to be produced. And this jet is also extreme, extremely luminous and relativistic. And so actually, uh, astrophysicists use the existence of jets and the power of jets to infer how black hole is rotating. And that is one way we can probe the properties of uh, black holes from this phenomenon. All right, with that, uh, thank you, Jane, for an excellent talk. Uh, I hope that everyone enjoyed it. And thank you all for coming to uh, to listen to Professor Dai share her research. We hope you all are well and safe and ever learning more. It's very nice meeting you. Thank you very much.